<laughs> you know, I blame you. <laughs> the McNaughton Rule an early, is an, was an early attempt to define insanity. We talked about this last time. The McNaughton Rule excuses criminal conduct of the defendant as a result of the disease of the mind. McNaughton, of course, was a, uh, an individual suffering from uh, delusions. Uh, he tried to kill the Queen of England, Victor Queen Victoria at the time. Uh, he was unsuccessful. She did not, he did not kill her. Uh, somebody knocked the gun away at the last second and the bullet shot up into the air. Uh, but she was really close uh, to, to him when they captured him. And she looked in the man's face and he, and he was growling and making animal-like sounds at her. So she decided that she was going to execute him. Uh, but of course, they, she couldn't do this. This was in the 18... The 1880s, uh, she couldn't do this. She didn't have that type of absolute control over England. So what happened was uh, he had to go to court. And when he went to court, they determined that he was insane, that he was making animal-like noises. Uh, anytime he talked about the queen, he was talking about what an animal she was. Uh, and so they decided that he was criminally insane. Uh, and they decided not to e execute him, but to put him in a mental hospital for the rest of his life. And of course that pissed her off, so she tried, she did everything that she could to get this guy executed. She tried to convince her, her prime minister, she tried to convince all these other individuals, uh, but the courts wouldn't budge, and, they, and he, he lived, despite the fact that, that uh, Queen Victoria, she had tried to have him assassinated at one point, which is something that potentially could have happened, you know, in the 15th century, but it didn't work this time, and uh, he uh, survived. So it became known as the McNaughton Rule. Um, and the questions uh, that they asked uh, about McNaughton, and this is a picture of McNaughton, you can see that he looks sane, perfectly sane, as long as you're not the Queen of England. Um, and he also didn't, he also didn't recognize her as the Queen, that was, that was part of his, his delusion. Uh, he saw her as a uh, somebody that that uh, wasn't uh, shouldn't have been on the throne. She was a, a relatively young girl when she uh, when she uh, became queen. She was only like 19 years old when she became queen, and he didn't recognize her as the queen. Um, so the questions that they asked did did uh, he not know uh, what he was doing when he did it? Or did he not know uh, that what he was doing was wrong? And of course, he didn't recognize the queen as the queen, uh, and he growled like a, an animal. Uh, so they determined that he was, he was insane, and they couldn't execute him because he was insane. The McNaughton Rule, or a close variation, is used in 29 states in federal jurisdiction. <clears throat> it has often been criticized on the basis that the cognitive focus, knowing wrongfulness, is too limiting and does not allow consideration of motivational and other influences affecting the control of behavior. I'm going to ask you all a question right now and you need to uh, give me a, an honest answer. How many people do you think plead insanity in the United States? Give, just give me a percentage off the top of your head. How many people? 16 percent? 80? 80 percent? 30 percent? 10%? 10 Nine. 30. 30? Share. 60. 60? 75. 75? 80? 90. 90. 70. 70. Okay. We're going to find out in just a minute how many <laughs> actually do. Uh, kind of kind of interesting, though. I mean, wouldn't isn't that what you would do if you were had committed a crime? You'd try to get off by reason of insanity. So we'll, we'll see how, uh, actually how many people plead insanity. It's not the only insanity plea that we have in the United States. 29 states uh, recognize the McNaughton rule. Uh, the Bronner rule uh, stems from the, the model penal code. Uh, this rule states that a defendant is not responsible for criminal conduct if he at the time of such conduct as a result of mental disease or defect lacks substantial capacity either to appreciate the criminality, wrongfulness of his uh, conduct or to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. The Bronner Rule is now used in 18 states 
and a version of it is used in the federal courts, about 18 states. Those 18 states are mostly in the South, including Arizona. Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Tennessee. The Bronner test uh, differs uh, from the McNaughton rule in three ways. Uh, by using the term appreciate, it incorporates the emotional as well as the cognitive determinants of criminal actions. Remember I told you last time, uh, there are some states where you can uh, plead uh, temporary insanity, and this has to do with this word right here, the, the word appreciate. There are not all states can you do this. Uh, if the McNaughton rule is, in, it is intact, then you certainly can't call something a crime of passion. But 18 states of the, in, in the United States, you can claim uh, a uh, crime of passion. And of course, they will call it temporary insanity, and potentially they'll let you off. Especially if it has something to do, of course, and obviously, it has something to do with emotions, but there are 18 states in, in the United States where you can com commit a crime of passion and get away with it. Now, most of the other states you can't, so before you commit a crime of passion, you might find out <laughs> if you're in one of those 18 states. Uh, it does not require that offenders exhibit a total lack of appreciation for the nature of their conduct, but only a lack of substantial capacity. So it can be temporary. It doesn't have to be permanent. The third one, it includes both a cognitive element and a volitional element, uh, making defendants' inability to control their actions as a sufficient criterion by itself for insanity. What happened over the weekend? A uh, guy went into a yoga parlor in Tallahassee, Florida, and started just pumping away with his 9mm pistol. Don't worry, saved a bullet for, for the end. He killed two and wounded nine. He was a member of an organization called Involuntary Virgins. Involuntary Virgins. In other words, these men are so ugly that women won't date them. They won't have sex with them. And so, so we have seen three cases. I was talking to Francis earlier about this. We've seen three cases where these guys have decided to kill the people that won't have, well, won't date them or have sex with them. Uh, one of them was in California where he killed 12. Another one was in Toronto where he killed six. I think he killed six, maybe I've got it backwards. He killed six in California. He killed 12 in Tor Toronto. In Toronto, he, he jumped into a, a delivery van and, and just started killing people on the streets running them down. And then this guy in, uh, in uh, uh, Tallahassee uh, killed two. He shot one woman nine times with a nine millimeter pistol. He wounded nine. So he, actually, he obviously reloaded. But evidently the women fought back. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been to a yoga, yoga part. What do they have? where they're doing yoga, but they don't wear very, they wear really tight clothes, so that they can, anyway, so all these women were in their tight clothes, and of course he's an involuntary virgin, <clears throat> uh, and he put it all on the internet, how, how he was, women wouldn't date him, and he had a uh, date with this one woman, he made a date with this one woman, and she didn't show up, and so he made a date with another woman, and she didn't show up, involuntary virgin. They're called invars, invers, I N V I R. That's the. They call women, men who are so handsome that they can date anybody and have sex with everybody. They call them uh, chads, and they call women who are so beautiful that everybody wants to date them and they get to go out every night. They call these women Stacys, chads and Stacys. I know. It's a group. It's a group in the United States, and this guy decided that since he can't find a date, that he's going to go into a yoga parlor and start shooting people up. He was a college graduate, graduated from Florida State University in Tallahassee, and he went into this yoga place and he just started blasting away. Killed two and, in, and uh, wounded nine women. 
And then in the end, he shot himself in the head. Killed himself. Couldn't stand it anymore. As strange as that may seem. What's the bottom line here? I don't know if there is a bottom line. Anyway, that's what happened over the weekend. Something else? Did anybody watch 60 Minutes last night? They were talking about uh, uh, um, assault rifles. And they were showing the difference between an assault rifle and a 9mm pistol. And they shot a chunk of gelatin. <clears throat> when I was in the service, uh, we went out to bivouac. We were, they were training us to be medics. And the last thing that we did, we went out to bivouac. And at bivouac, uh, they did all kinds of interesting training uh, exercises. But the first training exercise they did, they wanted to show us the difference between uh, an M16, an AK-47, uh, a uh, uh, M1 carbine, which is the rifle from World War II, uh, and a 45 pistol. We weren't using 9mm pistols at the time. This is uh, during Vietnam. So the last thing they did, they, they put together all of these things. And they had gelatin cubes that they were shooting with all these rounds. And they shot it with the 45, and the 45 just punched right into it. Made a nice hole in it, came out the backside. Took another gelatin cube, set it up there. They shot it with a, a carbine, M1 carbine. Punched a nice hole through it. Everything's fine. They took an AK-47, and they shot the same size cube with the AK-47. The thing exploded. Made a nice hole in the front, blew out the back. They took an A, uh, it was not an AR-15, but it was an M16, which is the military weapon that is the same as the AR-15. Shot that uh, cube. Has a smaller round, strangely enough, but it has more uh, velocity. And that thing went in, it exploded the top, and they shot down at the bottom, and it, and it curved, and it blew out the top. What they were trying to show us was the difference between one round and, and another round. If some rounds are, are high velocity rounds and they'll punch through something and they'll go all the way through and not do a whole lot of damage. They'll just make a hole through. And if you hit a vital organ, of course, the person will be up and die. But a military round is a tumbling round. This thing is tumbling as it's going through the air. So as it hits something, it will fragment and then it will blow out. And in the case of the AR-15, or the, uh, the M-16, the round didn't have enough power to do anything except explode and blow out the top. So that's the kind of damage that it does. AR-15, on the other hand, I'm not sorry, yeah, AK-47, on the other hand, blows out the back. Does exactly the same thing, but it has a little bit more powder behind it. And this is what happens. So one, some of the times when we were picking up people that were wounded, we picked up this one guy that was shot in the shoulder. And if you've ever watched old cowboy movies, people get shot. And they, where do they get shot? Well, they want to get shot someplace that won't kill them so that they can, they can save the heroin with their other arm. So they get shot in the shoulder. And then, of course, they're watering around with their shoulder hurt, and then they, they can still use their gun. And they would still save the day with their, with their good arm. And then, of course, they put their arm in a sling and everybody's happy because they were shot with a, with a 44 or whatever. <clears throat> but uh, we had this guy that was shot in the shoulder, shot right here, right, right below the, the joint, shot right there with AK-47. And so we're trying to save his life. He's bleeding like crazy, and we're trying to save his life, and we're trying to save his life. And, we throw him in a helicopter, we fly out, <clears throat> land at the hospital. We, it only took us like five minutes to get there. I mean, the guy was just flying. And when, when a helicopter flies really fast, it, flies, it points its nose down and just takes off like this. And that's what was happening. So here I am, I'm trying to save this guy's life, trying to, trying to keep the blood from, from bleeding, from this guy bleeding out. We get him to the, the, uh, the uh, it wasn't a hospital, it was a mash unit. We, got, we landed at a mash unit. We get him into surgery almost right away. He bled to death. Shot in the shoulder and he bled to death. <clears throat> Why? Because he was shot with an AK-47. And this thing, has a, it's not an explosive round, but it's a round that fragments and it blows out. And that's what happened. He had so much circulatory damage in his shoulder that all, all of these blood vessels bled out. 
We, he was shot in the shoulder and he died. Now, if he'd been shot with a 9mm pistol, of course, a 9mm pistol just punches a hole in something, goes straight through and comes out the other side. Doesn't, doesn't expand, doesn't blow up. It's a larger slug. And that's what they were showing last night. That's one of the problems with when we have, when, when we have people with military rounds, and we have people with military weapons, these things are anti-personnel rounds. And they, they kill people. That's their purpose, is to kill people. All you have to do is hit them someplace, and that is gone. It shatters bone. It doesn't break the bone, it shatters the bone. During the uh, Civil War, people would get shot with a musket ball, and the ball would go in and it would hit a bone and it would break it. But now a round shatters the bone. It splinters the bone. And that's one of the reasons why we have to have so many amputees. And this was on 60 Minutes last night. They were talking about why, why it's so bad when uh, some guy goes into a church uh, with an AR-15 and starts shooting people. The guy that shot up the church in, uh, in just north of San Antonio, uh, he shot 400 rounds before he left the church. Uh, he shot one lady nine times, and they said they couldn't even recognize that she was human when they, when they found her because they, it had blown away so much tissue. There was another lady that was shot nine times. She was laying on top of her children. She had three kids, and she was laying on top of them, trying to protect them. And they shot through her body into those kids and killed two of them, and the third one had four bullet wounds, and he's still getting reconstructive surgery. He, the bullets went through two people before they got to him, and it still did damage to him. He was on the bottom. <clears throat> what, what's the midpoint? My point is that uh, mil military weapons uh, are okay for <laughs> And this is the point they were trying to make last night. Um, and this is one of the reasons why so many people died in Las Vegas. He wounded 400 people, but he killed 59 people. He killed 59 people. Because those rounds, when they hit, they expand and they splinter, and now we got a problem. Now we got a really serious problem. Uh, same weapon in, in Parkland, that's why he killed 17 kids. Uh, the same weapon in, uh, uh, in Pittsburgh, AR-15. There's 11 million AR-15s out on the street. Ouch. That's a lot. Of, that's, and as long as you don't shoot anybody, you're okay. As soon as they start shooting at people, now we got a really serious problem. This is a really serious problem. This is an anti-personnel weapon, and it's made to kill people. Nine millimeter pistol, 22, I don't, whatever you want to use. I mean, the uh, strangely enough, the AR-15 shoots a 22. Uh, the, the cal it's only a 22.7 caliber, right? 0. 0.227. It's not very much bigger than a 22, but it has so much power behind it. Three times the power that a 9mm pistol has. That's what we were seeing last night. And of course, I had already seen this before because they were trying to train us uh, that when you get a bullet wound, uh, that, that what, the first thing you have to do is stop the bleeding because you, you have to put a tourniquet on the guy. And as long as, otherwise they're going to bleed out. And that's what happened with this guy with the shoulder. Because it was up here, there was no place to put the tourniquet. It was up here, up at the top of his thorax. It's right here. That's where he was shot. There's nothing we could do but hold pressure and try to try to stop, slow down the bleeding. And 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 I did. I slowed down the bleeding, but he he eventually died in in surgery. They couldn't they couldn't repair it fast enough, and he'd already bled out. Why am I talking about this? That's what happened this week. So anytime you hear that the guy had an AR-15, attacked somebody with an AR-15, now we're, we're talking about military rounds, military rounds, you're gonna see a lot more death uh, than wounded people <clears throat> because they're military rounds. The Insanity Defense Reform Act, the IDRA, uh, was enacted by Congress in 1984. 
uh, in addition to the elimination of the volitional uh, aspect, it also changed the insanity defense process as follows. It prohibited experts from giving ultimate opinions about insanity. In other words, I can't, as a psychologist, if I am in that case, all I can say is this is what the, the problem seems to be. I can't say, I can't use the word insane. I can't say whether I think that he's insane or not. All I can do is give my diagnosis. And of course, that can't include whether I think he's insane or not. Uh, it prohibited, okay, the burden is now on the defendants, uh, the, the defendant to, uh, to prove insanity. Uh, previously, the burden was on the prosecution to prove the defendant was sane. But now it is on the defendant to prove that they are actually crazy. Empirical research relevant to varying uh, insanity defense rules, even with the changes put forth by the IDRA, research suggests that verdicts do not significantly differ, differ as a function of whether the jurors have heard IDRA instructions, broader instructions, or no instructions at all. And this came up uh, uh, to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court had to make a decision as to whether we, they had to talk about the Bronner rule, the McNaughton rule, or, or the IDRA rule. Regardless of what insanity rule was used, college students showed very low uh, rates of recall uh, and comprehension of crucial components in various insanity definitions. I'm sorry. So the problem is we don't understand the insanity rule. Nobody understands the insanity rules except lawyers. So if you, I'm part of a jury and insanity is one of the pleas, the probability of me understanding what's going on is fairly remote. College students don't understand this. And they, of course, are some of the smartest people in the United States. Different stand standards of insanity make little difference in verdicts. Uh, a much greater influence may be ex exerted by pre-existing attitudes toward the insanity defense. And of course, if you were a forensic uh, psychologist, uh, you were a trial uh, jury selection, uh, psychologists, uh, that's what you would try to do if you were pleading insanity. You would have to determine whether these people understand the insanity rule or not. And it really doesn't matter as long as they accept it. <clears throat> if they accept it, then potentially your client will get off. Sometimes when the insanity plea works, the defendant spends more time in an institution than he or she would have spent in prison if found guilty. Remember, even if you murder somebody, there's a, there is a high probability that you will not spend your life in jail. Even if you're given life sentences, you can still be paroled. They have to, <laughs> only the federal government, uh, will we'll stand by their, by their, uh, the decision of the court. Oh my goodness. Is that bubble glue? Yes. Bubble glue, bubble glue, bubble glue. Okay. So the probability is that, uh, they won't, they will spend more time in a mental institution than they would in a prison cell. In fact, this outcome has led defense attorneys to request that judges be required to instruct jurors that if the defendant is found not guilty by reason of insanity, he or she will probably be committed <clears throat> to a secure psychiatric hospital. However, the Supreme Court has refused to require such an instruction. In other words, they can't tell you that. So what you want is this guy taken off the street as much as possible, as long as possible. So if, you, if they do get the insanity plea, they will probably spend more time institutionalized than if they were arrested. So what's the good thing about, let's say we've got a 19-year-old and he goes out and he offs two people and he gets thrown in jail for uh, two life sentences, theoretically two life sentences. <clears throat> So what's, what's the rationale with letting this guy go when he's 50 years old? Is there any rationale to it? Why would you do that? And is that okay? Is he a danger to society at 50? He was a danger at 19, obviously. He killed two people, robbing a convenience store. So he was a danger to society at 19. Is he still a danger at 50? 
Is he the same danger he was at 19, at 50? Why not? Because he's gotten older. His body's gotten older biologically. Does that make him as, not as stupid as he was when he was 19? A little bit more mature, maybe. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> he might have gotten help, too. I'm sorry? He might have gotten help, too. Probably not. Let's pretend he's in jail, and in jail you really don't get rehabilitated. No, of course not. So is he, is he the same danger he was when he was 19? Mm -hmm. I mean, stupid, stupid, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or is it? It turns out that it's not. <laughs> At 19, your brain's not mature yet. I hate to tell those of you who are still in your teens or in your early 20s, your brain's not completely mature yet. It won't make it there until you're 25 or 26 years old. So your brain changes, and it becomes more mature. Are you there yet? Are you yeah, there yet? You made it? I'm almost there. Okay. End of the month, and I'm there. End of the month, you're there. Okay. <laughs> tell me if there's a change in the way that you think. Uh, okay, so that, that happens. The other thing that happens is about age 30, your testosterone level starts to decline, about 1% per year. Okay. So his testosterone is probably 20% less than it was when it, he was 19. Well, at 19, of course, your testosterone is at its peak level, as strange as that may seem. <clears throat> so males peak at 19 or 20, 18, 19, or 20, and females peak in their 30s, as strange as that may seem. Anyway. So, okay, so a lot of things have changed. His testosterone has gone down, so he's probably less aggressive than he was when he was 19 years old. A lot less aggressive than he was. His brain has matured. So is it okay to let him out of jail? Should we let him out of jail? He's complete. He's not the same guy he was when he was 19. Going to have to leave to make more room for the rest of the people that are coming in. Of course, he's he's just taking up a cell. He's just now we can. Now we can out. put somebody else in that cell. Another 19-year-old. There we go. Another 19-year-old who really does need to be incarcerated mm -hmm. because he's not real smart. There, 19. The other thing that happens when you're 19 years old <clears throat> is that you're uh, filtering all everything that happens to you, you're filtering through your amygdala. Your amygdala is your emotional portion of your brain. So you re you're more likely to react emotionally than you are when you're older. And this is one of the reasons why sometimes a fighter will peak in his 30s. There's a there's an MMA MMA fighter out there that's 51 years old and he's kicking the crap out of everybody, especially the kids, because he never loses his temper. And you, it's it's easier to fight when you're when you're you're under control. You you can plan things out. And, but these kids, they get into the into the octagon and they they do stupid stuff. They want to beat the guy to a pulp. And of course, he just lets them swing away until they're so tired that they can't swing anymore. And then he he hauls off and defeats them one way or the other, knocks them out or whatever. <clears throat> okay, so the kid's not the same at 50 as he was when he was 19. Mm -hmm. So potentially we can let this guy go. But if he goes into a mental hospital, that's not going to happen. Because if he goes into a mental hospital, he goes in for the length of time that he would have if he had been convicted. Now he's in a mental hospital. He's going to be incarcerated potentially for the rest of his life. On March 30th, uh, 1981, John Hinckley Jr. attempted to assassinate President Ronald Reagan. Uh, the defense for Hinckley was that he had become obsessed with Jodie Foster's character in the movie Taxi Driver. And he was trying to impress her by channeling the actions of Robert De Niro's character in the movie. This is what John Hinckley did. Uh, Jodie Foster was at... Yale University. And he went to Yale and he wrote her poems and he slipped them under his, her door. I know. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I know, when guys would slip you poems and say that they're going to 
assassinate someone. Anyway, he, he, she, he became obsessed with Jodie Foster. Jodie Foster's character in the movie was only 13 years old. Uh, of course, they made the movie, and then a couple years later it came out. By this time, she's 15. Uh, he saw the movie over and over and over and over and over again. By that time, she's 18, and she's in college. Uh, he moved to New Haven, Connecticut, uh, where Yale University is, to be close to her. And he wrote her all of these notes. And theoretically, and he said that he was going to do something. He was going to make her notice him. And, of course, afterwards people went, oh, I wonder why she didn't send these letters to the FBI as a warning. Of course, these kinds of things come into the FBI on a continual basis, on a daily basis. You can imagine the letters coming in about Donald Trump. Or the letters coming in about uh, former presidents. They, the Secret Service uh, has a responsibility not only to take care of the current president, but also the former president. So there is a detail around President uh, Carter, uh, pres the two President Bushes, uh, and of course uh, President Obama and President Clinton. And two letter bombs were sent, or yeah, two letter bombs were sent to Clinton and uh, uh, Obama. <clears throat> That's what happened last week, week before last. Okay, and he tried. And the guy sent letter bombs to all kinds of. Democrats trying to kill him. Uh, who else got a letter? The Clintons got one. Obama got one. Um, George Soros got one. He's a CNN. CNN got three, as it turns out. Uh, Stayer is a guy in California who uh, started putting ads on television to impeach President Trump, and he got one. Okay, they found one. Another one over the weekend, by the way. And that was the one to stay or <coughs> found. <clears throat> Total of 16, 16 letter bombs. And we're not exactly sure they're all gone yet. Anyway, so we've got this guy that is obsessed with Jody Foster. Uh, he moves from, uh, from Texas uh, to New Haven, Connecticut to be close to her while she's going to college. She's not acknowledging him. He asks her for a date and she t turns him down. So now he's going to make a bold gesture to show her how much he loves her. So he decides he's going to assassinate President, uh, President Reagan. And he does, he attempts to assassinate him. He, uh, uh, shoot, he has a, a relatively small handgun, it's a 38, so it's a relatively large round, uh, but it's just a, it's just a slug. Uh, so it just punches a hole, okay. Uh, so he, he actually kills a policeman, he wounds uh, uh, Brady, his uh, press secretary, shoots him in the head. Uh, another round bounces off the uh, limousine, and since it's an armored limousine, the round splinters when it hits the, uh, when it hits the car, and one of the ricochets uh, embeds itself in uh, Reagan's lung. So that's the only way he hit him. He didn't actually shoot him. He, it was a ricochet. He shot off the door, and because it was a uh, armored vehicle, the, the round bounced off, splintered bounced off, and one of the, one of the splinters, the pieces of shrapnel, uh, lodged in his lung, and it almost killed him, strangely enough. Uh, the plea was successful, and Hinckley was remanded to a mental hospital until 2016. Now, this happened in 1981, so he was in the middle hospital from 1981 until 2016. John Hinckley, Jr. Jr. Republicans were pissed. They were really pissed. They wanted this guy not only executed, they wanted him executed on television so that we could all watch this man being executed. Well, at this point, the federal government hadn't executed anybody since the 1920s. Uh, so we, we weren't, the federal government wasn't executing anybody. The first person they executed was Timothy McVeigh, the guy that blew up the Murrah building in Oklahoma City and kill 127 people. <clears throat> but they executed him. Not on television, of course, but they did execute him. So the idea, the, the thought was that we were going to execute this guy. And as you can see, he's not a bad looking fellow. He's not that bad looking. So we hospitalized him and we locked him up, locked him up in the only federal um, mental hospital at the time, 
which was St. Elizabeth's in Washington, D.C. So the strange part was, Hinckley was uh, less than a half a mile away from the president when they locked him up. Conservative politicians were incensed that the insanity plea was successful, and they tried to change U.S. statutes, making it more difficult to plead insane. They thought this was, uh, this was not right, that the insanity plea was being used way, way too much. And somebody said 90%. There we go. Harlan, okay. 90%. All right. It's not right, by the way, but, I mean, people have these ideas. Uh, people that don't, even, don't study these things, they have these ideas that they, the insanity plea is being used too much. And people are getting off for being, doing really horrible, horrible things. Five states abolished the insanity plea. These are relatively conservative states. Idaho, Montana, Kansas, Utah, and Nevada. Very, very conservative states. Idaho, Montana, Kansas, Utah, and Nevada. Kansas is so conservative. How conservative is it? Kansas is so conservative that you can't teach Darwinism in school. You can't teach evolution in their schools in Kansas. That's how backward they are. That's pretty damn conservative. <clears throat> anyway, okay. <laughs> I love my picture. Uh, the insanity defense is uh, most often used in cases in which the defendant is charged with a violent felony. It has to be violence. Uh, so you can't just use it for, uh, I, I stole a package of gum. The insanity please not. I mean, you, you wouldn't use it. It just isn't something that is necessary. The majority of defendants found not guilty by reason of insanity uh, have been diagnosed as psychotic. So they have to either have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder in order to be uh, to use the insanity plea. So we're not really dealing with a whole lot of people. Certainly not 90% of the people that commit violent crimes. Rogers in 1986 estimated that about one of four or five defendants being assessed for insanity engages in at least moderate malingering of mental disorders. In other words, they're making it up. Yeah, it's fake. They're, it's, 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 they're faking it. So one out of every four or five defendants is malingering. In other words, they don't really have a problem. They're just acting that way. <clears throat> defendants found not guilty by reason of insanity typically have a record of prior arrests or convictions, although this rate does not exceed that of, of other felonies. Of other felons, uh, they come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, usually. They have a prior history of psychiatric hospitalizations. Uh, uh, pleading in GRI is, doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you've never been in a mental hospital, if nobody's ever diagnosed you with a, a psychosis. The probability of you getting away with it is fairly remote, so you just don't do it. The lawyers are too smart to let you do that. This is Harley Quinn and the Joker, right? Isn't that who that is? Okay. Where did I find that picture? <laughs> I don't know what site you were looking at. I don't know. <laughs> uh, they do look crazy, though, don't they? They have previously been found to be incompetent to stand trial, so these individuals are the ones that plead in GRI. Female defendants uh, found not guilty by reason of insanity have similar socioeconomic, psych psychiatric, and criminal backgrounds to their male not guilty by reason of insanity counterparts. Harley Quinn and the Joker. Okay. <clears throat> Melton et al. in 2007 reported the following three beliefs to be prevalent among the public. A large number of criminal defendants use the insanity defense. This is what the general public thinks. Those defendants found not guilty by reason of insanity are released back into society shortly after their acquittals. And the third one is that persons found insane are extremely dangerous. And here's reality. Are you ready? Are you ready for reality? Sorry. Uh, I know. The, Disney, the D Disney version is always a lot more fun. How often is the plea used and how often is it successful? Although the public estimated that the insanity defense was used in 37% of the cases, the actual rate was only 0.9%. There you go. Nobody came close. 
But that's okay, because most of you agreed with the general public. You think it's used a lot more than it is. A lot more. Somebody, some people, Arlene, for example, thinks that it's used almost every time. <laughs> and that's okay. I mean, why should we have this information unless you're taking this class? Or you're a lawyer. There's no reason to understand how many people actually plead insane. Of the nine insanity pleas raised in every 1,000 uh, criminal felony cases, about two will be successful. So 0.2% are actually successful. It's very, very rare for somebody to plead insanity and for them to actually be termed insane. A lot of times it's uh, a case uh, that is highly publicized, uh, like the case of Andrea Yates. Remember, Andrea Yates, the first time she went to, to trial, uh, they determined that she was not insane. And she was convicted of, of five uh, uh, murder, uh, she was convicted of murdering five people. The second, but then the, the state just went, ins went, went insane itself. They just went crazy. They, wanted, they said that this wasn't right. There was something wrong. And it took, it took months, but the appeals court said, well, maybe you're right. Maybe there was just too much information out there about Andrea Yates. The assumption was that, 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 that she needed to be punished, and this was the decision that was made. So let's go ahead and retry the case. And in the second case, it never went to trial. She was deemed uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. And she is in, she was remanded to the mental hospital in Vernon, Texas, and that's where she remains today. If you kill your child because you have postpartum depression, and there have been estimates that 80% of women suffer from postpartum depression, if you kill your child because of this, are you insane or are you not insane? Because you're depressed. <clears throat> One of the things that doctors will look at after a woman has a baby, her hormones will change markedly. I mean, it, it goes from, from uh, extremely high levels to extremely low levels, below what, the, what she normally experiences. So the probability of her suffering from depression is fairly, is fairly high. Not every, it doesn't happen to everybody, but it happens to a lot of women. And the question is, the baby blues, postpartum depression, is it really depression? Is it postpartum psychosis? If it's postpartum psychosis, she can never be around babies the rest of her life. We see this from time to time. It doesn't happen all that often, but we do see it. <clears throat> so what's, are, is she insane? If she happens to do something or neglect the child and then the child dies, uh, should she, she be charged with a crime? Maybe if she didn't get help before, if it wasn't documented before, because that's the only way you could probably argue with it. You remember Andrea Yates sought help. And she was told not to get pregnant again, and her old man knocked her up anyway. Because that's what his religion told him to do. So he had to do what his religion told him to do, not what the doctor told him to do. Hmm. In England, if a woman kills her child within the first 18 months of the baby's life, she's not charged with it. She's released on uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. It's, it's automatic in England. So... That's England. That's not the United States. And each state has their own laws. Chris is smiling. Let's find that out. <laughs> how can you say that? That's, that's horrible. How, how can a woman kill her baby? <clears throat> Happens all the time. Wait a minute. What were, what, what's the movie we were watching? Not Fatal Attraction. The one with the lady that didn't have any underwear on across her legs. What was it? Sharon Stone. I can't remember the name of that movie. But in that movie, there were a number of women who had killed their children. Andrea Yates is in with another lady who killed her children. Basic instincts. I'm sorry, what was Basic instincts. Basic instincts, right, basic instincts. This lady was a murderer, and she would murder men because they were such horrible people. Pigs, dogs, snakes, mules, no. Is that, is that Andrea Yates? Is that the, 
Is that uh, the lady that the prostitute that murdered the guys? Alien, yeah. Uh, Eileen Warner. Yeah. From Florida. From Florida. She was executed. One of the only women that's been executed over the last ten or fifteen years. They made a movie of her life. She hated men. She was a lesbian. She was a prostitute. She hated men. She was molested. Potentially, she had a baby by her brother. Her brother, whether it was seduction or whatever. Anyway, she killed five, five of her Johns, as it were. Anyway, okay. So, not guilty by reason of insanity. All this stuff is horrible to think about. The median number of insanity acquittals per state per year is 17.7. So if you live in California, well, in California they have a much higher number because they have a much higher population. But the average number per state is 17.7. So you can multiply 17.7 times 50, and that tells you how many people in the United States get off by reason of insanity. California has the highest number per year at 134, while Florida has, is second with 111, even though, well, and they have a large population as well. New Mexico averages zero while uh, San Diego averages 0.1 per year, which means they have one every, every decade. New Mexico has none. They have none at all. So there you go. If you, if you decide, so the lady, that lady that put her daughter up for prostitution and her boyfriend is the one that raped and murdered her, her daughter, if they plead insanity, the probability of them of it being successful in New Mexico is zero for any of the three of them. And this hasn't come to trial yet. And I, I get to hear this every, every night if I listen to the news, because I get all New Mexico news. All my television comes out of Albuquerque. So. Isn't that terrible? Why do I care about Albuquerque? <laughs> Most acquittals are, are for felonies, of course. And that's why we're even thinking about this. What happens to defendants who are found not guilty by reason of insanity? Many mistakenly assume that defendants who are found not guilty uh, by reason of insanity go free. Stedman and Braff in 1983 found that defendants found not guilty by reason of insanity in New York had an average hospital stay of three years, longer for those who had committed more serious or violent offenses. So they do go into the hospital, and they do stay for an extended length of time. What happens to defendants who are found not guilty by reason of insanity? This, of course, is Andrea Yates. Some states use a procedure known as conditional release, in which persons found not guilty by reason of insanity are released to the community following a period of hospital confinement and are monitored and supervised by mental health personnel. So that's what's going on with young Miss uh, Andrea Yates. She's still in the hospital, by the way, in Vernon, Texas. And uh, since she was uh, convicted and then not convicted of murdering five people, she'll stay in the hospital for the rest of her life. They've already determined that. When they put her in the hospital, they said she will never be released. How dangerous are defendants found not guilty by reason of insanity? Because uh, most who are found not guilty by reason of insanity are committed to an institution after, after their acquittal. It is difficult to assess the risk they pose to the public safety. Now, if they were put in prison, of course, they wouldn't get any treatment whatsoever. But because they are in the hospital, they get treatment every day. The limited evidence suggests neither no difference in recidivism rates between the NGRI defendants and regular felons or slightly lower recidivism rates among the NGRI group. And the reason they would have lower rates is of recidivism is because they are getting treated, as I said, every day. And if you go into the, the prison system, of course, uh, the probability of getting any kind of treatment is fairly remote, depending on the state. Some states are fairly good at it. Other states do not even try, don't even pretend. And I think we are in Arizona, and Arizona doesn't even pretend. Okay. So the probability of getting drug treatment in Arizona or any kind of treatment in Arizona is non-existent. <clears throat> Judge Arpaio wanted to just throw the, everybody out into the desert <laughs> under tents. He was going to house everybody in tents. What an interesting fellow he was.
then maybe everybody would have got out the NGR because of the heat. Possibility, they would have, yeah, that, that potentially could have happened. You would have changed that law. What a great idea. <clears throat> it sends criminals and troublemakers to hospitals and then frees them. Researchers' response, uh, remember that some persons found in GRI are confined more frequently and for longer periods than defendants convicted of similar crimes. They go into the criminal justice system, a lot of times they're just released. Uh, a good example is uh, this. Have, have you seen the new ad from Trump, Trump's ad? He's got this one guy that murdered two cops in California. Uh, he says that he was released by the Democrats and uh, he was allowed in by the Democrats and then he was released by the Democrats. Uh, the reality is that the guy, and this is a real person and he really did what they say he did, uh, but uh, he uh, came into the country under Clinton. Uh, Clinton deported him back to Mexico. Uh, he came back into the country under George W. Bush uh, and there, and he was allowed, and he was able to stay in the United States after coming back across the border. Uh, that's when he murdered the guy. Uh, well, actually, he committed all these crimes. He was arrested in Phoenix, and Arpaio let him go. I know. Tough, tough art, Joe Arpaio. He let him go, and then he went to California and, and murdered uh, the two policemen. Uh, and now he says he wants to murder more people. He's He's uh, going to be executed because uh, he is uh, on. The, he ha has been given a death sentence. So we'll see what happens to this guy. I, I assume he's going to be executed. But of course, there were a bunch of lies in that in that ad, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> finding out, finding out that, that the the Republican Party lied to everybody. I know. I was so shocked myself. Really? It said right there the Democrats let him in, and they were the ones that allowed him to stay. It was the Democrats, not the Republicans. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> <clears throat> Tomatoes and water. Yeah, I know. Uh, it is a defense only for the rich. Uh, researchers response, there is no evidence of a socioeconomic or racial bias in the use of the success of the insanity defense. So it doesn't have anything to do with rich people. Uh, rich people do get off, but then again, poor people get off as well. It is, it is, it is a defense only for the rich. Uh, note that the Supreme Court case, Akke versus Oklahoma in 1985, ruled that poor defendants who plead insanity are entitled to psychiatric assistance at state expense in pursuing this defense. And of course, that is a problem. Uh, so if they allow them to, uh, uh, to, uh, to plead guilty uh, by reason of insanity, if they get this defense, then the state has to pay for their hospitalization. How important is money? Really? Aren't we, aren't we more worried about safety? Oh, no. No. It has to be with money. I know. This is, this is kind of exciting. So, if, if it costs us money, we don't want to pay for it. Wait a minute, we're trying to build that damn wall, right? Uh, that's going to cost us billions, maybe trillions of dollars to build the wall. I mean, it has to be what, 1,200 1, miles of wall? Is that a possibility? Trying to do it. Will we do it? <laughs> Depends on the emperor. The emperor? <laughs> <laughs> if we did, it might happen. <laughs> At this point, it looks like he's got no clothes, so I'm not exactly sure that wall's going to be built. But the people that like him, they, that's, they're screaming for the wall every time he has a rally. He had a rally last night. Build that wall. Build that wall. Lock her up. Lock her up. They still want to lock up Hillary Clinton, even though she's been, been exonerated of, the, uh, of all the charges that they think that uh, she should be charged for. She's already been exonerated. One of the things, that, and this is a hint and a warning, I know that uh, the election is tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, Mueller's going to come out and, and he's going to start talking to people, okay? So we're going to hear more about the Russian collusion case, case. And it's going to be a lot worse than you think it's going to be. So, so yeah, so that's just a hint and a warning. Uh, Mueller's been real quiet 
uh, since uh, September. Uh, sometime in September, yeah, beginning of September. But that's because um, the statutes tell tell them that they uh, they can't. A, a, a prosecutor like that cannot bring a case within 60 days of the election. So they've been saying nothing about the collusion case. But as soon as the election is over, and it could be Wednesday, it could be Thursday, but we're going to hear a lot more about the Russian collusion case because they've been working the whole time. So they've been accumulating in new information. So it should come out on Wednesday or Thursday. That'll be fun. Uh, it relies too much on psychiatric experts. Uh, cl can clinicians reliably and validly assess mental illness, mental deficiency, and neuropsychological disorders? The researchers say yes. So as psychologists, this is maybe something that you will have to do. You'll have to de determine if somebody is criminally insane, if they uh, were, were not in, didn't have the capacity to understand what they were doing. This is something that you may have to do in the future. Will this assessment permit the formulation of accurate opinions about a defendant criminal responsibility for past acts? Researchers' response, one remedy, uh, prevent experts from giving ultimate opinion testimony. In other words, they, they can't state that this person is definitely <coughs> insane or definitely sane. They, what they need to do is just give a diagnosis. This is how I see this individual. Although the absence of this information has not been shown to uh, affect verdicts, of course, uh, most jurors do not understand psychology. You almost have to study psychology to understand psychology. So they're as much in the, in the dark as most of us are in the dark about the law. There are all of these arcane rules. We don't know what they are. <clears throat> So uh, it's, uh, it's difficult for us to, to follow the law. This is an actual murderess. This is a lady that murdered somebody, and she did it with an AR-15. AR As you can see, she was a, uh, she's Italian. I know she may look Hispanic to you, but she's Italian. And actually, she was part of one of the crime families. She was a wife of somebody. And she killed a witness uh, to the, uh, she killed a juror. <clears throat> and this is, these are the pictures she took before she did it, as stupid as that is, thinking I'm so pretty that nobody would ever convict me. And she's not right. She wasn't correct because they did convict her. She's in jail. The guilty uh, but mentally ill, the GBMI verdict, about one quarter of states allow juries to, to reach a verdict of guilty by, uh, but mentally uh, ill uh, in insanity cases. So they are guilty. So they have been uh, convicted. But they don't have to go to prison because they are mentally ill. And this is what happened with my niece. I told you the story of my great niece. She was cooking meth in her house, or her boyfriend was. She claimed that she never did anything wrong, ever. And she was caught. And uh, she had all this crystal meth that she was trying to market. Uh, and so they sent her to, uh, or she went to trial, and uh, they found her guilty, but mentally ill, because she is bipolar. So she's not in jail. They remanded her to the custody of her grandparents, my brother and my sister. And then they took the house where she cooked the meth, and they knocked it down with a bulldozer. And my brother had to pay for it. Less than eight thousand dollars. So this property that he used to own in the middle of Muncie, where she was cooking meth, is a is, is empty now, and they can't build anything on it because it's content. The ground is contaminated with uh, the chemicals from the crystal meth. So there you go. I know this is stupid, isn't it? But she is not in jail today because she was guilty, but she was mentally ill, and that's how she got off. And she took, the, uh, she took the hit for him. She took the hit for her boyfriend slash cooker, the guy that was actually cooking the meth. I know. And then he knocked, he impregnated her. I won't say that. He impregnated her. So now the father of her child is this meth dealer. What a sweet, sweet family. 
So if you guys think you've got problems, I've got a, not only do I have a crazy person in my family, but I also have a lady that was so enamored with some guy that she took the hit for him. And she would have gone to prison for him. And he would have gotten off scot-free. But it's not the way it worked out. As it worked out, nobody went to jail. And my brother lost $8,000. Well, he lost more money than that because he had to pay for the lawyers. But, uh, yeah, ugly deal. Ugly situation. Guilty but mentally ill. That's what she, she was convicted of. So luckily she's got this on her, on her record, so now she can't do anything. If she does, she has a conviction for, uh, for a fairly serious felony. The guilty but mentally ill verdict, uh, typically a judge will sentence a defendant found uh, guilty but, but uh, mentally ill exactly as one found guilty of the same offense. In other words, he will put them in a mental hospital for extended length of time. She was not because she was pregnant, so he didn't want to find out. I know, she was pregnant. Hmm. She's the one that uh, they were giving her um, uh, medication. So she's a heroin addict. Uh, so they were giving her medication so she wouldn't take the heroin, which is much more destructive to the baby. And she was not only taking that drug, but she was also taking heroin at the same time. So she was getting a double high. Uh, so you think you've got problems. You think you've got crazy people in your family. I got a lady that tried to give birth to a heroin addict, and she did give birth to a heroin addicted baby. He was that far away from dying. And they saved him, and, but it took, him, took them six weeks to get him off the heroin. Six weeks. In some jurisdictions, the guilty by, uh, but uh, mentally ill convicted individual who starts his or her term in a hospital and then uh, will be transferred to prison after treatment is completed. This sometimes happens. In her case, of course, it didn't. In others, the individual would receive treatment while serving a prison sentence. It, in her case, it didn't because she was, she was bipolar. Uh, uh, so they didn't do that with her. And she was also pregnant. They didn't want to uh, endanger the child. Note that sometimes overcrowding at hospitals means that defendants go to prison without treatment. And of course, that's not what happened in her case. The defense of diminished capacity. Several states allow a defense of diminished capacity. It applies to defendants who lack the ability to commit a crime uh, purposely and knowingly. They have diminished capacity. So sometimes they do things like they steal and they don't realize what's happening. Or somebody, uh, they have a, uh, they don't react to people very well and somebody comes up to them and they attack them. You know, so it's assault. Theoretically, it's assault. Defense of diminished capacity uh, differs from insanity in that it focuses on whether the defendant had the state of mind to act with purpose and intent to commit a crime, not on whether they knew the crime was wrong or whether they uh, could control their behavior. Um, I was working uh, in a rural health clinic. Uh, I went to a, a nursing home to draw blood from some of the people that were, were there. I went into this lady's room and I'd drawn this lady's blood probably 15 or 20 times. Uh, sometimes she talked to me and sometimes she didn't. I think I've told you this story. Anyway, she, uh, uh, she had Alzheimer's disease uh, and I knew that. Uh, so I went into the room and I started talking to her and she was standing there and usually she made sure she was all covered up. I mean, she was very fastidious. She didn't even want me to see her neck. It was one of those kind of deals, and then she'd stick her in a, in a, I'd have to roll up her sleeve, and she'd have on a house coat, and she'd have on a nightgown, and I had to pull it all the way up, and it was always really tight, and I could barely put the tourniquet on, I barely had enough room to go, but I got the blood. I always got the blood, that was it. So this time I came in, and there she is, she's standing in front of me, she's got her nightgown on. She just has her nightgown on, and she screams at me, Johnny! What are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. And she had this huge television set. This was back in the old days when television sets were sheets. They were, they were, they were like tables. I mean, this was a huge television set. It was sitting on top of her counter. It didn't have the very, very big screen, but the thing must have weighed 200 pounds. She grabs a hold of this thing and she scoots it off and she throws it across the room and it misses me by about this much. 
And I'm standing there, and here this television set comes shooting across the room, crashes onto, hits the wall, crashes on the ground, busts into a million pieces. Of course, it bounces onto my leg. I'm standing there. Of course, I'm Johnny at this point. I'm Johnny. <laughs> And so then she comes at me with her fingernails, and of course I fend her off. She's just this skinny little nothing of a lady. She weighs maybe 100 pounds, and here I'm trying to keep her off. And the nurses come in, and they just start laughing. They think it's the funniest thing in the world. And of course she's trying to get at me with her fingernails, and she scratches my arm. <clears throat> nurses say, why don't you come back later? We'll, we'll sedate her, and you can come back in and draw her blood. So I finished my rounds and came back. And she was okay. And then she starts having me having a conversation with me as if I were Johnny. Evidently, when she was 15 years old, Johnny was her boyfriend. And Johnny left, went off to war. This is, you know, World War II. Mm -hmm. anyway. <clears throat> so what's my point? Diminished capacity. This lady had diminished capacity. And here she is. She attacked me for no reason at all. Thought I was the wrong person. I'd never been... I have a brother named John, but I don't, he's like 5'10", and I'm 5'6". He's good looking, and I'm not, you know, it's that kind of a deal. I'll show you a picture of him. I got a picture over in my office. I'll show you a picture of my brother. We're all dressed in our Army uniforms. He's, I mean, I'm in my Air Force uniform. They're in the Army uniforms. We're all in the military at the same time during Vietnam. And, and, other, and, and he's much better looking than the rest of us. So nobody would ever get me mixed up with Johnny, okay? Anyway, she thought I was Johnny. <clears throat> diminished capacity. Obviously, she had diminished capacity. Uh, okay. Elimination of the insanity plea. Uh, some have argued that the abolition of the insanity defense, of course, five, uh, five states have already abolished it. Remember, the conservatives were, they were, they were high up on their horses, ready to do away with the insanity plea because they, they thought that the liberal... Um, uh, government, the liberal po politicians, the liberals in the United States wanted to make all these crazy people, they just wanted to release them out on the, onto the streets. And they wanted to, of course, incarcerate them all. Uh, others argue that we cannot talk about guilt without bringing in the person's state of mind. And the reality is, we always think about this when we see somebody kill somebody. What was the guy thinking in, at the synagogue in uh, Pittsburgh two Saturdays ago? What was he thinking about? He said what he was thinking about. We need this information. We as Americans want this information. We want to find out why they did it. We're still pissed off because we don't know why the guy shot up Las Vegas. We're, we st still have no clue. Normally there's a hint. They put something on, on social media. They left a letter that talked about this stuff. The guy that uh, shot the people in, uh, in Tallahassee over the weekend, uh, he was on social media talking about being an involuntary virgin. And that's why he did it. Because these were all attractive women in very, in very tight clothes. So he went into that yoga parlor and he just shot the place up. Because these women would not date him. They would not have sex with him. So he, I don't know what he's, well he was planning on killing himself. Obviously he did. He shot himself. He, sh he wounded nine women and killed two. And they were, they were fighting him, and that, that upset him. Maybe that's why he shot so many people. We know why he did it. We, it's right there on social media. So we want to know. We want to know if they, what's going on in this guy's head. We want to know what the guy was thinking when he shot up the synagogue. And he, the, and he was in his 50s. The people he shot were in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. He shot a woman that was 97 years old and killed her. The doctor escaped and came back in to see if he could help people when he got shot and killed. Dr. Wolf. So why did he shoot them? What, what was the reason? This is something we need to think about. Why did he shoot the people at the synagogue? What was his excuse? What was the reason behind it? We want to know the reason. You guys want to know the reason because you don't want somebody going into the gas station and just shooting the place up for no reason whatsoever. Are they going to shoot up the, the gas station for the same reason they shot up the synagogue? 
This makes you feel safe if you know that the reason he did it doesn't have anything to do with, with you. Why did he shoot up the synagogue? Why did he do it? He, he told us. He told us on social media. He was on social media just before he went into the synagogue to shoot the place up. He didn't like the Jews. He didn't like the Jews. I want all Jews to die. So are you guys worried about some guy deciding to go into the gas station and blow the place apart? Shoot the place up? No, you're not Jewish. You don't have to worry about it. Why did the guy shoot the two pe the, the two older people? Ah, it's old people are getting shot. This is scary. No, no. The two people that were shot, the two black people that were shot in Louisville at the Kroger store, he shot them because he, he hated black people. So you guys don't have to worry about that. You're not black. <clears throat> he wanted to kill black people. He tried to get into that black church right next door. Mm -hmm. Instead, he got into the Kroger store. And then somebody else engaged him with a, with a pistol. And he wasn't able to kill anybody else. So you don't have to worry about that now. But what about going to a concert? Oh, my God. What if you go to a concert? Is there going to be somebody up on a 36th floor blasting away at everybody at the concert? That could happen. Mm -hmm. Couldn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we need to know why. We need to know if it's going to happen to us. That's why it was so scary when the, the kid went into Parkland School and killed 17 people. And he wounded four. How do you kill 17 and wound four? You kill 17 because you're using a military-style weapon. And if you hit somebody, it's it's going to destroy that tissue. That tissue is gone. It's, the bone is gone. The, the blood vessels are torn away. So they may bleed out. You may, even if you don't hit them in a vital place, they may bleed out. Um, that's scary, isn't it? Okay. Uh, the guy that shot up the church. Of course, he went into the church because he had a lot of relatives there. And he was pissed off at his relatives. But he didn't, get the, he didn't get the right ones. He didn't kill his, his ex-wife, which is the person he was aiming for. But he shot 400 rounds in that church. You know how many times you have to reload to shoot 400 times? I know. That's a lot. So he was just shooting and reloading and shooting and reloading. Do you, do you need to worry about that? I don't know. Should we be worried about this stuff? This is crazy stuff. Don't wear yoga pants. Uh-oh. <laughs> you guys are in trouble. <laughs> Don't wear yoga pants around that crazy guy. Anyway, around somebody that is an involuntary virgin. It's a it's an organ it's a group and they're they've got a they've got a website. You can go on the website if you like. These guys are are complaining about the fact that women won't date them. Isn't that a horror? <clears throat> it's ugly guys that women won't date or there's something else. They have body odor or something. The United States Supreme Court in Eddings versus Oklahoma held that a trial court uh, must consider any potentially mitigating information, uh, such as evidence that argues against the death sentence, uh, when considering a sentence of death. Some jurisdictions also consider the question of a defendant's future risk to society. This is what happened to Paul Manafort. Paul Manafort went in uh, for his case. It was a slam dunk, as the prosecutors said. Um, but he was only convicted of 8 of 18 because there was somebody on the court that would not convict him of um, anything that had to do with Donald Trump. This is, it, was a, it was a person that was very much in favor of Donald Trump. And they needed a unanimous decision to, to convict him of anything, as strange as that may seem. We need to stop right now, and we'll pick this up next time. And we'll